Hmm. <coughs> I am not seeing a way to make you a co-host this time. That's really weird. Hmm. Cindy, do you think it's because Marin? Marin might have opened it. Marin, do you want to click on Marissa and see if you can um, make her co-host? Yeah, because you opened up faster than I did. No problem. She's co-host now. Okay. So that was the issue. I hadn't magically opened our meeting. So there you go. All right. Okay. Um, let's see who we have here. Do we have all of us? I see. Okay. So I have um, the only one I do not see is the mayor, and I'm sure she will join in a minute. So let us do a roll call vote to begin this meeting. Lori? Aye, Garcia here. Marissa? Marissa Carey here. Marin? Marin Goldstein here. Jonathan? Jonathan Schmidt here. Shannon? Shannon Dunham here. Cynthia Kwasinski here. So we will open this meeting and I know the mayor will be here in a minute. Um, so the first announcement I just wanna make is welcome to the May 25th meeting. And I want to uh, explain to everybody, I was out for surgery. I really appreciate the school committee doing a phenomenal job of stepping in and taking care of everything while I was gone. I'm back. Uh, but I want to thank everybody for persevering and doing what needed to be done while I had to be out. So thank you. Um, Dr. LeClaire, do you have any announcements you would like to make? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this was on our social media, but it's worth mentioning again. Today we partnered with the City of East Hampton Health Department the Northampton Health Department and the East Hampton Fire Department to hold a student vaccine clinic at EHS. We had a very successful clinic with over 100 students receiving the first dose of the vaccine. Um, we're so thrilled that we were able to support families in our community. Thank you to the Northampton Health Department, the East Hampton Health Department and the Fire Department for their support to make today a success. Also a shout out to the East Hampton Police Association and the East Hampton Firefighters Local 1876 who donated $5 tandem gift cards for all of the students that took part in today's clinic. Um, this evening, there is a concert band, chorus and school of rock band, Vinyl Poncho concert, all under the direction of musical director, Sean Ulias and it's going to be performed this evening in the student parking lot at EHS. In addition, the show features a guest appearance by a local band, the Colony Motel, which is fronted by our own Mr. Brown. Special thanks to Mr. Yulia's, um, Ms. Paulus, and our custodial crew for pulling this together. It's nice to be able to have an event, an outdoor event. Um, next, just a reminder to folks, we have graduation on Friday, June 4th at Daly Field. Graduation will be held outside and we will follow the new guidance from the state. Uh, and a reminder that unvaccinated audience members should plan to wear masks. Um, as we end the near end of, as we end, near the end of the school year, each school is holding end of year events. Please make sure to check your child's school newsletter for information. That's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Um, we also uh, need to mention when our next meetings are and that tonight's meeting, we will adjourn um, from executive session. We will um, be going into executive session to discuss bargaining with the union. Um, so our next meetings are June 8th. July 20th, August 10th, and August 24th. I don't think you said that, did you? I'm not repeating it, okay. 
um, usually do that so quickly. So um, we will be adjourning from executive session. And do we have any correspondence? We do not have any correspondence. All right. Okay, so we're going to open this up to public speak. Um, I'm going to ask that you hold it to three minutes and that you state who you are um, and where you live. And could you please signal by either putting up a hand, shouting out, putting your name in, so that we can make sure that we call on you. Looking. Do not see anybody right now going, going. Okay. I do not see anybody, Marissa. So we're going to close public speak. All right. So now we have po uh, policy subcommittee updates. Shannon? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we had a meeting. Last week. Holy moly. I'm sorry. Hold on. There, is that better? Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so we had a meeting last night to discuss um, some of the policy changes that we needed to make based on the governor's um, new rollout. Um, we had actually just discussed and voted on the EBCFA policy on 427. Um, so I'm gonna propose the changes that we discussed last night and then ask that we waive um, the requirement for a second reading and just accept the changes this evening. Um, if we wait until June 8th, we literally have one week of school left. So I'll, I'll let you know what the changes were. Um, for those of you that have the policy in front of you, I, can, I don't share screen, so I'm sorry, but um, we are going to remove in the second paragraph where it says a face covering that covers the nose and mouth must be worn by all individuals in school buildings, on school, gra school grounds, and on school transportation. We're going to remove the on school grounds. Um, we're going to add um, when outside, if social distancing cannot be observed, masks will still be required. If there are any changes that are made will be subject to review by the superintendent. So basically we're leaving it up to the superintendent and also, you know, the students and the teacher's discretion. Um, if, you know, students want to huddle in a group, you know, they need to leave their mask on um, even if they're outside. So, you know, there is a little bit of a contingency there, but um, those are our proposed changes. If anybody has any other suggestions, that would be fabulous. No, does that sound fair to everyone? That sounds good. Okay, so I would like to make a motion to remove on school grounds in the second paragraph um, and insert prior to exempted from this policy are students in pre-K. Um, if outside social distancing cannot be observed, masks will still be required. Any changes will be subject to review by the superintendent. So, so oh, first, sorry. first let's let's vote to waive the second reading, and then we'll yes, vote please. on on the. Um, we don't have to approve the changes first. No, we have to approve the second reading that we're waiving. Correct, Sue. Yes. So we'll we'll vote on that. So we should have a motion to waive the second reading, and approve that first. Someone want to make that motion? Make a motion to skip the second reading. Okay. I'll second that. All right. Any discussion? We'll take a roll call vote. Lori? Lori Garcia, aye. Marissa? Marissa Curry, aye. Marin? Marin Goldstein, aye. Jonathan? Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Shannon? Shannon Dunham, aye. Mayor? Whoops, you're on mute. Mayor LaChapelle, aye. And Cynthia Krasinski, aye. Thank you. Now, the okay. motion. Thank I'd you. I'd like to make a motion to remove in the second paragraph on school grounds and insert prior to exempted from this policy 
um, outside, if social distancing cannot be observed, masks will still be required. Any changes will be subject to review by the superintendent. I second that. Any more discussion? Okay, Lori. Larry Garcia, aye. Marissa. Marissa Curry, aye. Mary Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Shannon. Shannon Dunham, aye. Here. Whoops. Mayor LaChapelle, aye. Cynthia Krasinski, aye. Great. Thank you. Sue, do you want me to email that to you or did you get it? I should be all set. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So is that that's all you have, right, Shannon? Uh, um, right now we are gonna be scheduling a meeting for probably in June to discuss um, some of the changes that need to be done um, with some of the um, special education and health services, et cetera, um, to be inserted into a manual for the health department. Thank you. Finance subcommittee. We have not met since the last meeting. Okay. And uh, the collaborative, Jonathan? Sure. <clears throat> so our next full board meeting is uh, tomorrow evening. Um, I will say, uh, we met to interview our two finalists for the executive director position last week. Um, I'm not going to go into details just because I believe contract negotiations are still pending, um, but um, following our meeting tomorrow and you know, with a little bit more time for that, I'm sure I can give you a full uh, update at our next meeting um, next month. So um, June 8th. Yep, yeah, but we had you know two fantastic finalists that um, we're all really excited about and I look forward to finally getting to share that with you. Excellent, thank you. For some of you might have started to hear through the grapevine. <laughs> um, and do we have a COVID response update? Yes, I would like to say that um, we agreed that yesterday was our last COVID response team meeting of this year and hopefully forever. So I would like to publicly thank um, the team, and it was led by our director of special education, Sarah Mochek, with all she has on her plate. She did a great job leading it. Obviously, Dr. LeClaire was at every meeting. Um, I'll name the people in our schools first. So if I pronounce any names wrong, could you please correct me, Dr. LeClaire? So um, Lindsay Broussard, our RN in the district, um, our public nurse, Amy Hart, um, Meredith Belise, our principal from Whitebrook was on the team. Uh, Brie Eistat, our public health official was also on the team. Uh, Dr. Kristen Duchesne, our um, district pediatrician and um, Nellie Taylor also was there as our union rep. And I would like to especially thank Dr. Megan Ward Harvey, who was our epidemiologist and acknowledged that she did this on a purely volunteer basis from the goodness of her heart to do what's best for our district. And I thank everybody and we really worked well as a team and I think it brought some sense of um, security to the district, to the parents, to the teachers, and it was a horrific year, but as a team, we were able to get through it. So now I would like to really say that I am thrilled to say that I'm going to shift my hat over to the wellness committee because we can focus on wellness rather than a pandemic. And, um, was it just last week? I think so, Lucy. We met, it seems like a long time ago, but it was just last week. We met an outside meeting under the tent at Whitebrook. Dan Stern, the vice principal was there. Scott Cavanaugh, one of our teachers who was a leader on bike sa safety in the community and on the Manhattan Rail Trail. And Lucy Friedman Bell is our coordinator for the Safe Routes to Schools run by Mass Department of Transportation. And she just would briefly like to introduce herself and she has a very brief presentation and we're thrilled to welcome her to East Hampton. Um, did you get your sharing capabilities, Lucy? Let me check. Yes, I did. Thank you, Marin. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Lori, for that introduction. And thank you everyone for having me. Um, like Lori said, I'm Lucy and I'm the Safe Routes to School Outreach Coordinator for East Hampton. Um, I'm just gonna give everyone a brief introduction into the program um, and then talk about some upcoming activities in East Hampton. So um, Safe Routes to School is a program of the Massachusetts Department of Transportation that works to increase safe student walking and biking. Um, and our program is focused around uh, six E's to implementation, which are education, encouragement, engagement, evaluation, engineering, and equity. Um, and we are not a um, stay in your lane program. We really focus on taking um, a community-based and collaborative approach. So while we work with schools, we also work with community organizations, planning departments, parks and recreation departments, parents, um, bike and pedestrian committees. Um, so I met, uh, like Lori mentioned, uh, I met with Lori um, and Scott and Dan uh, last week to discuss student walking and biking in East Hampton um, and some activities that we could work on together um, to support and, and hopefully grow uh, what's already going on. And a big focus of um, activities over the next year or so, year or so um, is going to be supporting students who are walking and biking to the elementary schools currently uh, in transitioning into walking and biking to the new school. Um, so just a couple activities that we have um, coming up. Uh, we're having a walk audit uh, on June 4th, uh, where we um, will walk around the area surrounding the Whitebrook Middle School. It'll most likely be in the afternoon um, to assess the infrastructure there for walking and biking. Um, and the city planner will be coming along with us uh, right. for that. Um, so uh, in the future, we will use the report from that walk audit to create walking route maps that will connect uh, the neighborhoods near the elementary schools to the new school. Um, and any of you are welcome to come to this walk audit. Um, walk audits are really an all hands on deck situation. Um, and so anyone who knows the area, uh, who has kids that walk and bike, uh, we really, really um, value your perspective. And, and um, that's super helpful. So. We're also looking at launching a parent guardian travel survey, uh, which provides some really, really uh, helpful data regarding current levels of walking and biking. Uh, in the fall, we're looking to host some bike and pedestrian safeties at the schools uh, and adopt uh, pedestrian safety curriculum into um, PE classes at the schools. In the fall, we're also looking uh, to have a bike rodeo, which is um, a fun uh, community event where um, kids can practice their bike skills um, and participate in a, in a bunch of um, games uh, sort of regarding bike safety. Um, we're also um, looking to celebrate International Walk, Bike, and Roll to School Day in October, and then hopefully get some uh, ongoing walk and bike events going after that. Um, and then in the fall uh, and next school year, we're also looking to establish a Safe Routes to School Task Force, um, which is a collaboration amongst school staff, school committee members, parents, community members, city officials, um, and others that meets regularly to promote walking and biking to school and in the community, uh, and also address community infrastructure issues. Um, there's definitely lots more um, that we can do in the future. Um, so this is sort of just the beginning. But um, just to return uh, to something that I said in the beginning, Safe Routes to School is, is really a collaborative effort. So the more people who are involved and invested in it, um, the better uh, it is for all of the kiddos. So um, if you would like any more information um, or have any questions, please um, reach out to me or feel free to pass along my contact information to anyone who might uh, be interested or have any questions. Um, my phone number and my email are here um, on the screen. Um, and I'm happy to talk with anyone about Safe Fruits um, and I'm looking forward to working with you all. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. And we will look forward to welcoming you back again to East Hampton soon for the audit and for helping with the rodeo and all of the great things that you're gonna do. And Lucy is the one who hand delivered everything that the, the treats for all of the students who participated in our walk, bike and roll event earlier this month. So thank you, Lucy, for everything. And if anyone has any trouble getting in touch with Lucy, you can contact me and I'll give you her contact information again. Thank you. Thank you. So now on to our superintendent update. Thank you. Uh, this evening we have two presentations. I think they flow into each other nicely. Um, I'm going to introduce Julian Levin, who all of you know is our curriculum director and also the administrator that has oversight of our diversity and equity department. And Julianne is going to introduce the folks that will be giving our equity presentation tonight. And then I will follow up that with our SRO um, presentation. And I think Shannon may have some information that she wants to contribute as well to um, the SRO comments that I make. But I'm going to turn it over to Julianne now. So Julianne, I'll give it to you and you can um, introduce folks and what our topic is tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, I'm also the grants manager, but that's more for the second part of the presentation, not the first part. Um, so I am here to give you an equity update. Um, I did want to just give you a couple um, little tidbits about elementary and middle school, even though the focus of tonight is really about high school. Um, you heard earlier this year from Jill Collins and Hannah Elliott, who just magnificently kept the social justice PLC um, for our elementary schools together and um, very resourced um, all year. So I'm just tremendously, tremendously grateful to them. Um, I'm also tremendously grateful to them because they're excited about expanding their PLC um, through eight to eighth grade next year. So um, if you remember what they do is they're creating tools on a teaching tools on a month by month basis uh, to supplement the curriculum um, to make sure that we're getting at um, some of the harder truths um, to teach in history and uh, our community. So they've been doing amazing work and they are continuing to do it and they're expanding it. So it's um, wonderful to watch. And I hope that parents are seeing that come home um, some. Um, if you are, I'd love to hear about it. If you're not, I'd also love to hear about it. <laughs> um, so my work is, is definitely across the district. And I'm very lucky to have at the high school um, someone who I can give most of my trust <laughs> to carry on the nine through 12 work. Um, so Cindy, I'm gonna introduce you. I also want to introduce um, Amy Cronin DiCaprio who's here from Safe Passage. And um, I think you are flowing into one another. So Cindy Mojica is gonna start us off. Um, Cindy is the since, since we keep changing the title of this role, I'm just going to call this person um, our superhero. Um, and that's Cindy, the diversity and inclusion liaison. And um, Marin, do you have you have the, the screen sharing capabilities? Because Cindy is going to want to share a screen. Yeah, we should yeah, be open up. for multiple. Excellent. All right. So Cindy and Amy. Here's our equity update from the high school. Let me put this in. So hi everyone uh, again. And I'm going to be sharing an update from the Diversity and Inclusion Belonging Center. Um, I'm going to, there. Um, my name is Cindy Mojica, like Julianne says, and I work at in the room 104 first floor in the high school. I have been working there since October 5th. We did a presentation in December 
And now this is a continuation of that presentation and see what we have been doing. And then I'm going to present Amy who works with Safe Passages and you will understand after I do the introduction. So let's start. So the Diversity Inclusion Center has been part of Isianton High School since spring 2017. The center was established from recommendation by the Attorney General's report after an investigation and their findings reflected inequality and discrimination within the school. And since then, the center had recruited multiple volunteers for projects that reflects the EHS students population. The center has worked directly with parents and students offering a safe place for everyone who walk in the center. The center con concentrate on offering providing services to the mo mo minorities and marginalized communities. In 2019, the center received a grant from Safe Passage. The grant is called the Healthy Relationship Grant. This grant covered 13 hours of a diversity inclusion liaison, a curriculum that will be in a curriculum that will be offered to the students this coming fall. So our projects and accomplishment, um, in the past three years, we have been working on bringing more diversity and inclusion to EHS. The projects that have been done at the center goes from parent education on different topics to our most recent, the Little Black Museum that was created on February 12, 2020. This museum has been a learning experience for those who have participated. This year, we recreate the museum virtually and more than 200 students with their teachers came and watched the museum. At the end of each show, we did a poll that asked what percentage of the material is new to you. And the highest one was 46 to 61%, which show us that this information should be shared more often so students and staff are more aware of Black history and how these past events affect current ones. Um, we will provide this link. This is the virtual version of it, so we will provide it later. We, um, the other project that we had, um, um, it has been another project that has been fulfilled, has been the alliance with the EHS library with the help Miss Cannon. I adore her, thank you so much. We have purchased 20 plus books that the authors come from diverse group that includes black, Latinx, LGBTQIA plus and Asians. This project started no on November, 2020. I asked Miss Cannon for a list of our direct um, district library that had all the books under diverse or diversity. And after an extensive research, I discovered that 70% of the books were written by white authors. After this research, I started working on a list which consists of Black, Latinx, Asian, LGBTQIA+, and Native American authors. The list was generated and Ms. Cannon placed the order. As soon as our libraries will be benefit from a an amazing group of authors that our minority children will identify and see themselves on it. We also acquired 10 new books in Spanish. We will continue working on bringing more resources for the teachers. These are the books that we purchased, some of the books. Um, I encourage you, contact the library, the Hampton Library. They're amazing. The celebrations at East Hampton High School by uh, the center, we have celebrated a few events since the students are back uh, that are full of information for administration and students. Each bulletin board will have a QR code that will direct them to a video on the information. This included woman recognition through the, through the years, poems in different languages, crisis numbers, and scholarship for Asian American Pacific Island students. So in March, with the Women History Month. And you can see there, they have the QR lo um, logo and the students will link to their cell phones. Uh, we did National Poetry Month, we did one in English and then we did a whole bulletin board in different languages. And this month, soon to end, Mental Health Awareness in Asian American Pacific Islander Month. So the Mental Health Awareness wall that you read over there, the bulletin board with the flowers, that was messages from the faculty at East Hampton High School. And it says, you matter because. So they all wrote a message so the students can read it. Um, this is the beginning of it. It's not, 
it's not the, the ending of it, but that's the beginning of it. So all of them, and we posted there, they're very beautiful message. If you want, you can ask or stop by the school maybe. <laughs> Other items, we have been collecting data and academic achievement, absence, failing, discipline, mental health. This way we can see where do we need to focus and correct the current outcomes. So what we have been able to identify by doing this data collection is better broadband needed at home, like the internet last year um, because of the remote learning, need better technology tools like laptop, mouse, headsets, mo modems, more languages available for students and guardians, Disparities between race and economic status in academics, learning, and discipline. Meal distribution, transportation for regular semester and summer school. The need for more diverse literature and representation in the district. Training based on bias, pronouns, and race. Grading system and absence system should change when crisis like a pandemic is affecting the district. And emergency regulation and procedures should be put in place summer school program, who qualify, and what other programs can the district offer to students. The need to of two or one clinical counselor for the upcoming four years of school. Mental health has doubled between students and all races, economic status, and gender identification. So this data is current. I uh, just wanna say that this is the last semester the, quarter, the fourth quarter, and this semester is not close and numbers could change, but this is a visual of what we are right now. So these are under 60, so students who have grade under sister. So we have the three top bars are about how many students are enrolled right now per grade. So in ninth grade, we have 97 students enrolled and a total of 29 are under 60. And a total of 20 of those 29 are under 50. The three bottom bars are per class. And the best way that I can explain this is that one student can have English, math, and history. And those can be like 54. And then one and under 50. So that will equal three. That's why you see more a higher number in the bottom bars because one student can have multiple classes under 60. It's not that we have 60 students failing. <laughs> it's just a multiplication of one student per class. So then we see the 10th grade. These are totally recent as yesterday. And then we have the 11th grade and the 12th grade. So why we do this, like it says right there, we can identify summer school numbers, like what we need to supply to students. Do we need online classes more? Do we need in-person students? Who qualify, who doesn't qualify? So we are ready to support the students, especially in the high school, especially 11th graders who are coming 12th graders. Current and future collaborations. We collaborate with Safe Passage, Holy Community College Learning Center. We'll be collaborating with them, SPIPI, the Collaborative, UMass, the Asenberg Business Center and Public Health Department, the State House, Isiamton City Council, Isiamton City Arts, HBCU, which stands for Historical Black, Black Colleges Universities, retired teachers, and local businesses and residents of Isiamton. The center have collaborated with all these people and will be collaborating the fall of 2021. Different programs. Connections and opportunity for students. We have offered a series of opportunities for the students at East Hampton High School. Uh, we have the Black Lives Matter workshop. We have first HBCU virtual college fair, community action youth programs, the Yellow Forum, which is youth and legislators and officials. Parenting Wisely, Health Co Youth Coalition Executive Committee, Internship through the City Council and the DESCO, Young Man Leadership, uh, Say Something Youth Initiative. And this is where I'm going to introduce Amy. Uh, she's from Safe Passages, and she's going to talk about more about this because this is an event that is coming up in the summer. It's our Summer Leadership Academy. So Amy, you can take it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, 
Cindy, I, if it's okay, um, could I share the um, my screen to do the what to show folks the website? I was going to put the link in the chat, but I realize now that there's no chat. Is that possible for me to start sharing? Should be. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name's Amy. Uh, Amy DiCaprio. I'm the prevention coordinator for Safe Passage in Northampton. Um, if there are folks here who aren't familiar with Safe Passage, we are the domestic violence agency in Hampshire County, um, and we support survivors um, of domestic violence and relationship abuse, and we support their families. Uh, the other thing that we do is we engage our community um, in education and violence prevention efforts. Um, so my role at the agency is overseeing um, all of our community violence prevention initiatives. Um, so I am here to talk about the partnership that Cindy just mentioned, um, the Say Something Youth Initiative Partnership. Um, is a, It's a collaboration between Safe Passage, East Hampton High, and the um, and community action youth programs. Um, and what our project is, is we're um, the violence prevention program for teens. Um, and our hope is that uh, this will offer opportunities for students and faculty and caregivers in the East Hampton High community to get involved in culture change at the school to support healthy relationships. Um, I'm gonna attempt to share my screen to show folks um, just briefly, our website. Hopefully, that is working and folks can see this. Um, yep. We can thank see you. it. Awesome. Um, so, the address for this, it's um, for our website, is say something now.org slash youth. Um, so, that's say something now.org slash youth. You can also get there through the Safe Passage website if you forget that or write it down wrong. Um, so, um, yes. But um, so you can see on this website, I'm gonna go through some of this stuff, but I wanted folks to have a visual because um, I'm a visual learner that helps me. I'm gonna scroll down. This here in the yellow, um, join our virtual summer leadership academy is the opportunity that Cindy was just talking about. So right here from this section, um, you can see there is a link for an application. Um, an email address that goes straight to me. Um, if with any questions, it's just say something at safepass.org. And then this link here is for some info sessions for students and parents who want to learn more. Um, and there's, all, there's gonna be an info session tomorrow evening at six. Um, it's technically being billed as an info session for parents for the Summer Leadership Academy, but truly anybody who wants to attend to get more information about it um, is welcome to come. Um, if you click on, um, on this info session link, it basically opens up an invitation card um, and the, the um, information for the Zoom meeting is down here at the bottom of that, you can see. Um, so yeah, so the, the Say Something Youth Initiative, um, it has an in-school component. Um, as Cindy mentioned, that will be starting in the fall um, and I'll say something about that in just a minute and then also two extracurricular options. So one of which is the Summer Leadership Academy. Um, and then there's also an advisory group that um, we'll be recruiting for in the fall. And that will be made up of students and faculty and um, parents and caregivers. And both of those extracurricular options um, are stipended opportunities for, for students to participate in. So um, the Leadership Academy this summer for students who participate um, they'll get a $200 stipend. The programming is running from June 28th through July 9th with, um, with July 5th off for the holiday, that Monday. The program's gonna be run virtually, so over Zoom just to maintain COVID precautions. Um, and basically um, there's a lot that's gonna happen there and I don't have enough to, um, space here to, to, um, to explain about all of it. So come to the info session if you want more than what I'm gonna tell you. But basically, um, students will learn a lot about leadership skills and advocacy. And um, we're also, during the Leadership Academy, going to be piloting um, Safe Passages evidence-based, skills-based violence prevention curriculum. And this is the curriculum that's going to be integrated into ninth and 10th grade health classes at East Hampton High beginning in the fall. Um, so this is um, eight hours of programming 
um, on bystander intervention, violence prevention, um, healthy relationships curriculum that's going to be integrated through the ninth and 10th grade health class for all East Hampton High students. So that component, the curriculum is not extra extracurricular. It's it's curricular. It's built into the curriculum. Um, but the other two opportunities are paid. Um, we have a fantastic team of people who are working on this project. Um, we have two facilitators who are going to be in the school implementing the curriculum. They're fabulous trainers. They're also running the Leadership Academy. Um, they are so excited to be working with high school students um, and so excited to actually physically get into the building and meet young people face to face. Um, we were hoping to do it this year, but um, we all know everyone's hopes this year just took took a turn. Um, but um, yes, I think that's basically my time probably. Um, and let's see what else in the screen can I can I show you? It, definitely feel free to check out our website. There's um, it is sort of built for teams. There's sort of how can we help um, if young people have questions about whether their relationships are healthy. These all link to, to different places. And then we have a I need to talk or chat. Um, Safe Passage has a hotline for um, not only for people experiencing violence, but also for people who might be concerned about um, a friend or someone in their life if, if they need to talk to somebody. Um, and then this section here is if you are an adult and you're trying to learn how to support a young person in your life, um, there are some resources down here. Um, this again, contact us, this will go to me. This is our lovely team. There's Cindy. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm so excited about this project and I'm so appreciative to get to come and speak with all of you about it. Um, please feel free to come to this info session tomorrow at six o'clock. And if you are not able to make that, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. I am happy to answer questions about this opportunity. We are really um, hoping to get folks, um, young people involved, and then subsequently their parents and caregivers um, and interested faculty at the school also. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see all of you. Um, yeah, that's all I have. And I'm sorry if I went over my time. I kind of um, didn't keep track of the clock, but thank you so much um, for letting me come and speak with you. We're flexible and this was important <laughs> and we're excited. So don't worry about it. Great. Thank you. So my only thing is, do you have any questions about the the data or the programs that we're running? Um, I just want to reiterate that the numbers that we showed tonight, that data could change. Um, it's going to be crunch time in the high school for some students. So that, that could change. I don't know how much will change, but it could change. Um, I just want to say that from, you know, from the faculty, vision of it you know they're they're also getting their stuff uh in so do you have any questions for either me or amy mary you're on mute uh, this might be for one or both of um of you um so this is amazing it's it's very exciting um thank you for putting it together and doing the work um i have the utmost respect for our um, safe passage and their long history of just going to places where, where no one else will and, and shining light. So thank you. Um, and, and just uh, wondering with the Healthy Youth Grant now in public health and additional positions being added to the city's public health uh, department, will there be any chance for, I mean, it's two very different visions and objectives, but is there any chance for some collaboration there? Um, and if so, do we know what it would look like? Um, I can speak to that and basically say that, yes, that's on the horizon. Um, members of our team are going to the Spiffy Coalition meetings, the East Hampton Healthy Youth Coalition meetings. We're all, um, you know, really excited to figure out how to maximize um, all of our collective resources to, um, to support youth in East Hampton. That being said, there is not um, any solid um, joint initiative between all of these healthy youth partnerships right now. Um, most of our work right now has um, involved um, our, our, our recruitment for, um, for youth to participate in our curriculum adaptation. We've you know, reached out to those folks to see if they have youth that would wanna be involved. 
Um, we're also connecting with them um, to make sure that the youth that they work with know about our summer programming. Um, and, you know, and continuing conversations about any opportunities that are sort of on the horizon. I think that in terms of like the, the positions that have been created like through through this funding, it's it's really as Cindy said, the um, the supplementing of the diversity inclusion liaison position to be a full time position um, is the funds from this grant or what supplemented that role to be full time. Um, but that's the that's the extent of what you can call concrete for now. But um, lots of optimism. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. And how long is this grant? Um, so we're hoping it's a 10 year grant. Um, the initial okay. the initial funding period was two and a half years. Um, yep. The Department of Public Health has been very flexible and understanding in light of the fact that a full year and a half of that has been living in the upside down, basically. Um, so, um, but the the um, the governor's council, you know, has told us that their level funding um, sexual violence prevention for this coming year in the budget. We have no reason to believe that it won't continue to, to be level funded. And if that's the case, then this um, like $200,000 a year is, is built in for this project for the long haul. Um, so will that allow for the full-time funding for the position that um, Cindy holds now? Not necessarily Cindy the person. I don't know if you're going to be here for 10 years, Cindy, your choice. Right, right. But, but the, the actual FTE. Yes, so my understanding is that as long as the, um, I don't really know how the school budget works, but as long as the East Hampton High is, you know, what the school pays, like the, the position that Cindy holds is 27 hours a week. That's like what it's funded at, like through the school. Yeah. And so the funding from this grant basically supplements it 13 hours a week, and that's year round, and that's for the duration of, of the grant, like for this partnership. Excellent. Uh, uh, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. Any other questions? Um, I would just follow that up quickly with, um, we just received the prevention needs assessment survey um, data for East Hampton. And that's like a central um, data source that all of our healthy youth um, organizations sort of, you know, kind of get together on and collaborate on and around um, in terms of programming. And, this is, I think that this is a significant year because it's collecting the data from um, this year, this, uh, what did you say, the, the year in the upside down? Absolutely, yes. Um, and so I think we, we went to, there were, there were uh, pieces of all of the Healthy Youth Coalition and Safe Passage and um, the school department, all of the recent um, PNAS data um, release. And so we'll, we'll have a more East Hampton specific um, data presentation of that, um, probably from Rebecca Edwards, who's the Healthy Youth Coalition <laughs> coordinator. Um, and uh, that'll be upcoming. So that'll, that'll spur also some more collaborations so that we know the, you know, the direction we're going and what, that, um, what those partnerships need to support in terms of where our youth are struggling. Thank you, no, Dr. LeClaire. I was just going to thank our presenters, you know, from Julianne, who has oversight over all things diversity in the district. And, you know, it's a big job. Julianne's at all our equity committee meetings, you know, at the various district levels that we have them at. She works with Cindy. She works with the administrators on diversity issues. Um, so she's been really immersed in this work and, you know, I don't think it's, it's, um, um, I don't think anyone will be surprised that we were devastated when Asher announced that she was going to be leaving the district as our first, um, kind of engagement coordinator at the high school, but to have Cindy step into those shoes and she's done a wonderful job this year. She's just really, um, made the role her own and, I think um, in, as Amy said, the upside down year was not necessarily the easiest time to jump into a new role. Um, but, you know, Cindy was right there. She was pushing to get what students needed. She was in classrooms. She's made um, tremendous relationships. She's built tremendous relationships with um, the teachers that I've seen up there. So I really appreciate how 
Cindy has jumped in with um, both feet. And not to mention, she's part of the equity committee and she's also part of the SRO recommendation subcommittee. And we'll get into that next, but um, you know, she's just really been committed to the schools. And Amy, thank you for bringing this program to us and um, working on presenting it tonight. And I think there are great things to come with safe passages in our collaboration. So thank you to everyone. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I agree. Anybody else? All right. Thank you so much. It is exciting. So, Dr. LeClaire? Yes. So, I will now share my screen. It's a night of sharing, I guess. So, I am going to talk a little bit tonight about the recommendations um, and ultimately what our SRO program will look like um, next year. So let me um, do a little bit of a retrospective, um, kind of a what, what got us to this place in time. So looking back um, in the winter of 2020, which seems like forever ago, but <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. Um, it was the last school year. Um, we collaborated, the East Hampton Public Schools, we collaborated in writing a grant with the police department in the hopes of expanding police presence in the schools, specifically for our, we had an eye towards our new pre-K through eight school. Um, we wrote that grant uh, we collaborated with the East Hampton Police Department. I know this committee has um, inquired about grants. Uh, you know, I can say that we we write grants. I don't. Julianne writes grants all the time. Um, she's working on grants with the city planner now. I mean, we just there's always grants to be written. Um, but in March 2020, uh, the world closed down with the pandemic and everything was delayed, including the federal government. And we never found out about the grant until June of 2020, um, where we found out that the police department had secured the grant. Um, but what happened in the interim is um, as, as a community or as a nation, we witnessed the horrific death of George Floyd in the spring of 2020. And that caused us to examine whether adding another officer was the best course of action. And I think it, it really is um, important to say and recognize that today marks the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. And, you know, we recognize that as educators, you know, we continue to reflect and learn from the experiences of this, this past year. And um, so I just wanted to to kind of give some context around that. So to continue, you know, in late summer, the community began to voice concerns when they learned that the police department and the schools had secured this grant um, regarding police in schools. And it was on the heels of what had happened to George uh, in the George Floyd murder. And many communities, I think it's fair to say, also face very similar conversations. So the decision was made by the school committee at that time not to accept the additional officer for um, the use in the schools, really. We did not want to accept having a second school resource officer that we would commit to. Um, and the school committee and the community expressed concern over police and asked me to explore our SRO program just overall, the, you know, the, the program that we already had in existence, not just the new the, what the grant money was going to bring in, but where we were at that point in time. So rather than um, make a decision my, on my own, I kind of um, wanted to explore the issue a little bit. So who better to turn to than our equity committee um, at the high school, which is a longstanding, it's, it's in its fourth year and they really changed about a year and a half ago they really identified that they wanted to be the group that made recommendations to me on issues that related to equity and diversity so that's really become their charge so in august of 2020 we had a very 
um, I would say heartfelt discussion with, at the equity committee and, and a lot of people voiced very strong concerns about police in schools. Um, and so I asked the committee and I asked the school committee as well, if we could take some time to really explore the issue. I wanted to have people do some legwork around this issue. And so we formed a subcommittee of the equity um, steering committee. And that group met for the past year. They met from August of 2020 through April of 2021. Um, Julianne's a part of that group. Cindy's a part of that group. Um, Shannon was a part of that group. I um, chose not to be at most of those meetings. I didn't want it to be perceived as kind of administrator heavy. I knew that our high school principal was there and Julian was there and I really wanted to give people the opportunity to really feel as though their voices were heard. And um, so I kind of, I, I popped in and out a few times during the year just to check in with people, but there was a consistent group that met um, every month. And they did the research, they had the discussions and I'm sure Shannon can um, describe how those meetings were far better than I can. So I will leave that to her to talk about what meetings were like. And after much research, uh, they formed a set of recommendations that were passed on to me in late March. So um, I reviewed those recommendations and I wanted to have a meeting with key members from that subcommittee and also some administrators in the district and the police department because I wanted to get everyone kind of at the table to review the recommendations and to see how we could work together moving forward. So the outcome that we really wanted to um, keep was we wanted to still have a relationship with the police department and the school resource officer, they still has, have a position within the police department, but they are not going to be formally stationed within, within any of the school buildings. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. And here are some of the recommendations from that group. We still want to have a school resource officer. We want that person to be engaged in the schools. However, they're not going to have an office in our building. They're going to be invited into the buildings when it's appropriate, when there are times and situations that they can really contribute to positively. So we want to keep two-way communication open between the schools and the police. We rely on them to help support us. Um, and it's important that they also feel they can come to us if they have concerns. We want to collaborate on training and programming within the schools. Um, and we want to invite them in to help support us with that and to help be a be in the room with us when we take part in training. And we want them to um, be part of our student support team meetings um, as requested by school administrators. They can contribute to um, helping to support some students that really need their support. Um, so the bottom line here is, and I wanna try and put a pin in this, we want the school resource officers to come to the building when they, are, when they are asked to come to the building. We want to have an opportunity to invite them in. I can give you examples at the high school, they might come into a forensics class and talk to a group of students about um, police work and forensic work. So we want them to still be a part of that. What I think we want to try and get away from is the, the perception that they are patrolling the halls or in any way making students feel uncomfortable. We want to enhance the positive interactions that are um, things that are more structured and thought of appropriately. 
So our key understanding is we want to continue the positive relationship that we've worked so hard on in the past three years with the two departments, the police department and the school department. Um, we've tried really hard over the last few years to build um, some collaboration and some really good relationships. So we want to continue that. That's an outcome that we want. Um, before I talk about this last um, slide with future work, I just want to say that this was not in any of the recommendation documents that were passed on to me, but anecdotally it was said to me, and I don't know, Shannon might want to talk about this a little bit. What I heard from the subcommittee anecdotally was that no one got exactly what they wanted. The bottom line here was everyone compromised. There are people that firmly believe that a school resource officer or a police officer should not be in a school. And there are people on the other side of that issue that believe there's a benefit to having a police officer in a, in a school setting. So it can be a very polarizing topic. And what I appreciate is that this committee, which is made up of um, quite a few community members and administrators, really pushed through some very difficult conversations. And they really examined research at the national level. They really informed themselves um, about the topic. And I think some of them had to kind of step away from their own personal opinion about the situation and really look at the bigger picture. And so um, I, I really heard that from them. And I really think it's worth expressing to the committee because I know that come tomorrow, come next week, this topic will create a lot of um, conversation in our community. And there will be some people that will say, you're wrong for doing this and other people that will say you're wrong for doing that. And I think it's, it's a very challenging topic. So the bottom line is that I am going to accept the recommendations from this committee. We've met with the police department. We are on the same page. They understand and they want to work with us on making these recommendations come to fruition. So a few of the things that we have to do kind of laying out the work uh, that's to come next is we have a memorandum of understanding with the police department that was developed in the last two years. So we'll look to review and revise that collaboratively and to incorporate some of the new recommendations. We'll communicate with the Attorney General's office, um, which you know we have ongoing dialogue with them. They were instrumental in helping us uh, develop the memorandum of understanding previously, the police department and I. Um, so they'll, I think, want to be engaged in that work, even though really our relationship ends with them now. Um, we'll review our police and school policy uh, that will be something that Shannon, as the policy subcommittee chair, will um, schedule into one of our future meetings. I think there's work to coordinate with the police around identifying some of the activities that we will be able to have in school that they can really uh, be invited in for, drug, drug use prevention, education, safety protocols, things like that. We'll, um, continue to build our relationship with the police and this between the police and the schools. Uh, we will assess the program annually, which is also part of the recommendations. The equity committee would like to review data on a yearly basis and contribute to um, a dialogue with the superintendent, you know, about any program concerns that they have. And we'll continue to communicate these changes and adjustments to the school community. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. And I don't know, um, I'm going to stop the screen share. Shannon, if you have anything that you want to um, contribute. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I might have missed something, Shannon. So uh, no, you... <laughs> actually, Allison, you did a fantastic job. Thank you very much. I was afraid I was the one that was going to have to make the presentation. I really didn't want to. Um, so, you know, last summer we had um, a conversation based on 
not only, um, you know, the grant funding and also um, things that were happening in other school districts, wondering why we weren't doing the same thing. So I had opened up a can of worms there. And um, <clears throat> luckily with the group that we have, you know, we came to a decision that, okay, let's, let's really look into some data points. Let's get some more information. Let's really look at this um, situation and how we want to handle it in East Hampton. Um, it's, it's been a very informative year for me. Um, you know, I have my own personal um, reasons for being on the committee, um, but to see and hear other experiences and, you know, read about national experiences, not just um, our own local um, situations was very eye-opening to me and it made me want to do this even more. Um, and I feel like um, today for me seems like an appropriate day to um, go through this and, and um, put it out there to the community that, you know, East Hampton is trying to do the right thing. Um, and, you know, rest in power, you know, <laughs> to George Floyd and, um, you know, the, unfortunately, it opened doors for a lot of communities to start these conversations. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunate that we had to lose a life um, in order to have that conversation. Um, again, this is a conversation I've been trying to have for three years, um, almost four. And um, I'm, I'm glad that we've finally come to a place that um, we're in agreement and, um, you know, we can move forward as a community, as a whole community, um, not just, you know, um, I don't, I don't know how to put this, not just focusing on one group or, you know, individual. Um, this is taking care of our whole community, not just, um, you know, like I said, not just an individual. Um, so, you know, I do want to, I do want to point out that there were quite a few people on the committee that, you know, Allison may not have seen, um, Gabriella Aquino, um, I believe Jean uh, Libby was on the committee with us, um, at least in the latter part of um, the, the discussions that we had. Um, Julianne, I'm not sure if you can help me out here. I just feel like like the, it was a different group every single time, but like there was always, and Cindy was definitely a part of all of the discussions. Um, and it was a really, like I said, it was a really eye-opening experience and I'm glad I was a part of it. Um, I'm not sure where else I need to go. Julianne, help me here. <laughs> I'm, I'm a prompter. Um, I think you, you and Allison have summed that up really, really well. And I actually think that I would probably, um, I would like mess it up somehow. I already am. So um, why don't we turn it to questions? <laughs> I will. I just, I just want to say, you know, I, I don't. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I'm oh sorry. no, no. I, I just don't think I emphasized enough the work that the committee did all year. You know, I was trying to just kind of go through the slides quickly, but that group really spent hours of time having discussions. You know, doing the research, um, writing a document that I think they were smithed to death for, you know, a long time. But I really mean, ended. They really, it's fine. To be, they really wanted to be um, inclusive of all of the opinions, I think, in the group. And I think they were really careful about word choice and they were really um, considerate of making sure everyone's voice was heard. And I think that, you know, I know, and I, I'll say it again, this is a polarizing topic. And I, I want people to know that before you judge the decision that was made, please understand that a lot of people committed time voluntarily to work on this issue over the last year, rather than make a snap decision. They did, they did the work and they put in the time. So 
I just really want to recognize all of them. Bill Evans and Sue Wilson were oh my gosh. involved in it. <laughs> and, you know, they really kind of helped steer the ship. And um, so I, I want to thank all of them publicly for this work. And I apologize. Those two were critical in so many of the decisions that were made and the thinking that went behind every, you know, word and statement that we've made um, really came from that administration group. And oh my gosh, like it's, it's, it's amazing. Those two are amazing. Lori? I just want to thank you, Shannon, Julia, and the whole team for doing this because it is evident with this presentation that there truly is a sense of collaboration and cooperation. And we all heard our community. I mean, we had hours of public speak about this. You know, at, at the high, the we were right at the beginning of the pandemic, not knowing what we were going to do with the schools. And then we were like trying to listen to every concern about the SRO situation. And it, and it is a concern to many. And not everybody will be pleased with any decision that is made. And we heard that all year for whatever decision we made about the pandemic. But it's so evident that you put so much time and research into this. So it's not just the school to prison pipeline that people are so afraid of. We have to think about all of the good that officers do in schools in this community it's evident i mean as soon as i called chief alberti you know could you please help with the with our bike and walk event he was like yes he had his whole team there and then we had to switch the date because of the rain and we can collaborate and shannon you know i'm thanking you because i know that this is something that you have been really pushing for us to address mm -hmm. and i know the time and effort that you put into it and i'm really pleased coming from an educator standpoint knowing how important it is, how many good things that SROs do in the schools, that that can far outweigh the negative that can happen. And this conversation is going on in the Commonwealth. I mean, it's in Somerville right now. I don't know if you're following what's going on there, um, but we can make this compromise. Thank you so very much to all of you on this committee. Thank you. Marissa? I was just also going to express my appreciation. And um, I think, of course, there will be um, people out there who are not happy with particulars of this decision. But what I am most impressed and pleased about is that um, it seems like you found a real compromise that takes into account the um, the needs and the desires of people on um, a sort of many sides of this really complex polarizing issue. And I find that to be really remarkable. We're in a period of history where it's really hard to find um, compromise. And so to come to a solution where we've reduced um, that sort of pervasive police presence, that threat of surveillance, that all of that, while also still accessing all the great things that we love about community policing, um, just super bravo. Thank you so much. I, I, um, Mayor, go ahead. Hi, yeah, oh, echoing um, the comments of my colleagues on the school committee, I do have some, some questions about implementation. So um, when I look, the, the, I think it was on the first page of talking points, um, what will be the definition slash scope of the two-way ongoing communication? Uh, as well as the information or reasons why there will be a police presence at the student support team meetings. Um, will there be a limitation or a definition of uh, what information is shared by about a student or family member that is in contact or is involved with public safety, police, um, even fire, but does do not have a final determination on uh, charges or no charges, a memorandum of agreement. So what um, do we have other, like, so what the presentation we just had, um, I know Healthy Youth Coalition, they're kind of like MOA is involved in the grant itself, but do we have other uh, partnership MOAs with, you know, Safe Passage or, or whatnot for this work? And can some of the SRO, uh, language. I'm, I'm concerned with the current um, MOA is now, you know, 
I don't want to say outdated, but off task to where we are as a city and as a school district. So with the current one and reviewing it, what would be the timeline and consideration of overlap and, and um, some of the points I just mentioned? So I can answer the, the MOA piece. I think that would be a summer project that we would look to do for mm -hmm. implementation in the fall. Um, okay. Normally, uh, normally the, the resource officer is not really um, active in the schools in the summer. I mean, in the past, mm -hmm. they, they come in to work in the building yep. a few days a week, but they kind of revert back to the police department. So I think it's the ideal time to work on that. Um, as far as the student support team, I don't know, Julianne, do you want to take a stab at that one? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there, what we wanted to protect um, in this recommendation is that there are students um, who maybe outside of school hours um, have interactions with law enforcement mm -hmm. and um, that can come into the schools um, in, in various ways that, that yep. um, often lead to the, that student needing support. And so what, what we really wanted to maintain was that if, if that's happening outside of school hours, um, that the SRO is the point person within the police department to receive mm -hmm. that information and then to be able to um, be a liaison to our, whichever administrators, you know, buildings that might affect. Um, likewise, um, if, you know, if something comes into mm -hmm. uh, schools that is, you know, hearsay from outside of school that involves illegal activity, the principal may want to call the police department and say, hey, was there anything you, you know, or the specifically the SRO, right? Is there anything right. I need to know about this student and um, any police interactions they may have had? So we wanna keep those lines of communication open. Um, mm -hmm. So on student support team, sometimes, you know, there, there needs to be a conversation between mm -hmm. counselors in the school um, the building administrators, maybe even classroom teachers, depending on on how um, you know the extent of it, of impact the student may have had with um, any kind of illegal activity outside of school. Um, and in that case, we would want to be able to invite um, the police department to share um, with that team of supportive um, adults in the building, um, you know, what their concerns are, what what we can try, you know, what what we all know about the situation so that, that that's always open communication. So it's uh -huh. acknowledgement that um, there are things that the schools are gonna hear about and there are things that the police department are gonna hear about and we need to be able to tell each other because we know that students are affected in and out of school in, in, in different ways. So um, it's it's really hinges on that invitation. Yep. We want to make sure that um, it's not a surprise that a police officer is in one of our buildings, um, uh -huh. but rather that it's very intentional and it's in um, support of, of what students need. Um, so that's the student support part of it. Well, I, I may have missed er the earlier questions. I'm sorry. I, I, I have a, just a couple of, so I'm really concerned about that. I understand the reason, but I would like that information limited to what is reported on a police log. And if the oh, school has a suspect, Right, it has a suspicion that's formally reported and that log is available for review at all times and that it's disaggregated mm -hmm. for race as well as any discipline codes, uh, referrals to other social service, gender. Um, so that is tracked, of course, you know, with the school retaining the confidential, you know, yes. information, the names and, and whatnot. Um, and, and I also think, and maybe this changed because it's been so long, there are a couple of MGLs or maybe they're DESI regs where there are certain offenses where the school, the police must, like I, I'm thinking of 37H, guns and drugs, mm -hmm. that there's an automatic notification. Would that go, so, and that would be the SRO, I'm assuming, giving that to, I, I don't know if that's Allison and the principal in, involved. Um, but I, I think that that's, you know, just as far as clarity for the public, it's, it's really, um, it's really important. And I'll, I'll yield to Shannon. It, it sounds like she probably has questions about this. So, and, and then I'll go to my second question. Yeah, I just, well, can, let me just follow up really quickly that the MOU is very specific 
about the points that you just made around confidentiality and the Massachusetts general laws, MGL, Massachusetts general laws. That, Sorry, that's general great. I, I just think that there should be a disaggregated log publicly on our websites that show that. I mean, the police now are doing that for their logs. And, and I think where there's something specific to schools, that's, that's very important, not just clarity for the public, but for the police and, you know, school staff or visiting schools, you know, people who are coming in to, to give services or whatnot, that it's, it's very clearly delineated. I just wanted to mention that the MOA that we have now, um, while we had input from the police department as well as um, Allison, it came from a template that was yep. put out by, um, what was it, Desi? Uh, the state. The state. So, yeah. I mean, we don't have to use it. It was just recommended when we originally, because we never had one. Right. It was a until model. four yeah. years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we just used it as as a resource. I mean, so it, yes, it can definitely. And Allison, that was something that we had talked about doing as a group, right? Mm -hmm. I mean. Obviously, I think a with small your final group. say, yeah. right? Yeah, right. <clears throat> yeah, and I just want to, if I could, just clarify between the conversation with Julianne and the mayor, um, and I, I think you both know this, but again, for the public's um, digestion here, that when we talk about using um, um, information from the police department, either way, two-way communication. We're specifically saying, um, I believe, and, and Shannon and, and Julianne can correct me, what we're trying to articulate there is that we would like the point person that's working with the administrators to be the school resource officer, because there are many mm -hmm. officers in the department, and we know that they're all wonderful. They can all give us information, but we want to have kind of this one point person that mm -hmm. we know we have a rapport with who can pick up a phone and say, I know the middle school principal, let me call her. Or I know, you know, the counselors, right. let me let me stop by the school and see them. So I think the point of it is that we want to emphasize that we want to maintain a relationship with kind of one specific person as that school resource officer for the two way communication. I completely understand that. I would, I really question the need for an MOA if we're not assigning the SROs as one option in the grant. Every department works across each other and also several departments have specific liaisons like the veterans, the seniors, um, even for some of the DPW stuff and why that person wouldn't be identified just as a specific liaison, the community police officers, who would be the contact, I don't know, if, like splitting it between pre-K-8 and the high school, I'm not, you know, whatever makes sense. I mean, I think that that person and that contact, right? You want it as consistent as possible because mm -hmm. they know the people and understand the culture. And it's also easy for our police force after hours, you know, I mean, we only have the eyes on the kids for six hours in school, the other 18 hours, the, the rest of our officers know exactly who to go to. Okay, this is the R SRO for like, this is the school liaison. Um, so I, I just, and I, I do, I worry about because of this change um, and this, this great work, there's some slippery slope about a memorandum of agreement that doesn't pertain to a, an officer that's specifically stationed in a school during school hours and what MGL is around and federal law about sharing of information above and beyond um, police policy, which we're rewriting like, as you know, Allison, right? I mean, we all are, but, um, and we're going to have more stuff come down from the state. I do think that'll happen before the end of the year. Um, you know, just to, to kind of wrap up, I mean, I, I see the current MO, MOA being invalid um, and she'd be suspended with a formal vote that it is invalid by this group and that police do not go into the schools unless it is health is is harm imminent harm until there's a new MOA or we, we decide like what we just decided like you know looking at the grant um, I really think we need to define 
what it is, uh, uh, what that contact and information sharing is, I would not be, I would not be, I would not want to be a teacher, right, who is thinking this is what an SRO or this is what our police, police liaison is, and then use a procedure from last school year under an old MOA, which is dramatically, the expectation is dramatically uh, different. I mean, I think the chances of that, you know, this big, and they should go through the principal and sure there's a procedure. Mm -hmm. um, but as we all know, there are a lot of procedures coming at our educators in the fall and our families and, and a whole new world. To have this be very clear, um, and, you know, I'm going to say um, to the parents in this committee and the school committee and our police officers, I am not. And I do not, and I'm not in my control to be misconstrued. I am not looking to cut any police officer position. SROs are exclusively funded by the police department under my purview in the general fund, and they were not cut, regardless of where they are um, stationed. And that is my continued uh, position, unless the city council cuts it. Um, but, but this is not about job, uh, job elimination. This is about the work that you've been doing and what we have found out about our community and that quite honestly, the kids who are having trouble getting into school or again, with all of their classes, right? They're, they're so likely to say something to an educator, you know, to get that information out for the other 18 hours during a day, I think is really where we need to focus. I'm very excited about the work that we've heard tonight and, and how it can boost with public health. And, and quite honestly, take some pressure off the schools so education becomes, you know, more and more the focus and do the same with policing. You know, policing, everyone's trained, you know, very specially. Well, we need to, to collaborate and bring in public health, um, social workers and support. And, and I firmly believe there's too much of that responsibility on schools today, and especially in Massachusetts. It's, and I, and I think we've seen the danger of it. And, and our school district in particular, has, has fallen um, in, into a hole a couple of times because of that shift on the state and federal level about putting too much on our, on our schools. So that's why I asked for the, um, uh, the changes um, and, and this, and the model, you know, I, I, yeah, the model from the AG, I, I think, Allison, it was actually, it's a model policy, but, but I think your team did a lot of, like a lot of what you guys negotiated like ended up being adopted by the state, if I if I remember yes. that correctly. So yes. I yes. have faith that the MOA for that purpose is is great, and we know it. Um, but I I just not sure why we need it within the scope of the grant and the liaison program that Chief Alberti has set up with so many other community um, groups and interests. Well, I think uh, so. I just want to pick up on two points that you made, Nicole. Number one, I want to um, clarify, it is not our expectation that our S the SRO position would be cut from the police department. The S in collaboration and speaking with the police department, that role will kind of turn into more of a community policing right. role. They will still be our school resource officer. So I don't want the community to have the perception as the mayor art articulated already that we're looking to eliminate uh, a, a police officer position. That's not the intent of these recommendations. Um, so I, wa I wanted to clarify that as the mayor did. The second thing I would say is the memorandum that we created two years ago was one of the recommendations of the work that we are engaged in um, with the attorney general's office. So um, I would not feel comfortable suspending that at this point in time without having the dialogue with the Attorney General's office about the plan that we're putting forward to, um, to the schools and to the community. And as, as the mayor articulates, perhaps yeah. it goes away, perhaps it morphs into something else, but you know, I think that there's an expectation that we are fulfilling the um, kind of the recommendations that were given to us by the attorney general's office. So, and the attorney um, general uh, releases from that agreement a year ago, 
And I would say that we're actually in breach of that agreement and the law by having an MOA that's completely not updated to our current structure. The police at this point with down staffing cannot commit any staff in an SRO direct in the school except for imminent harm. So we are now having a, a document out there that's really invalidated. It's a breach of our own contract. I think it's very different. I think it's very difficult. I think it puts our staff, our police officers and our family in, in a liability um, that they don't intend to do it, wouldn't want or don't think that they're in because this MOA is still there. The police should not be doing any SRO activities in our schools as defined by that grant or that MOA until a new MOA is, is rewritten or is put aside with the redefinition of community policing, which we have plenty of language. And I think it's a conversation between this committee and maybe it's executive session and uh, Chief Alberti and a representative from the AG's office. And I'm you know, putting this very plainly on the public record because I have grave concerns. We can't pick and choose what agreements we're gonna follow even if they're null and void because of changes in the world. Nicole, I think you, I think Mayor, you bring up a good point, and I'm happy to explore that, um, and and communicate that information back to the committee. I think it's, I think you're, I think you're right. We need to look at it. Now, so the agreement from um, Chief Alberti, even even though he's he stated that he was not going to put an officer in the building. Um, Allison, we're still bound by the attorney general until the end of the school year. Is that correct? Yes. And that was, um, the MOA was a requirement. It wasn't a recommendation. It was a requirement. The recommendation, it, the requirement for MOA is only if we're using the SOR, SRO model that's described in the MOA, which we are no longer doing. So we are now putting false information out to the public and to the AG because we do not have that SRO model. I, will, I would ask the chair for a vote that the MOA as it exists now is ended and that the, the committee relook at if we need an MOA, which is not required by the grant that funds the second position. I understand the first position is tied up with the AG, but I think there's a conversation to have and I think there needs to be a clear, um, I think there needs to be a clear message to our city, but but also as stewards of a budget and liability and risk management. That document, I mean, we're in the middle of a racial, you know, a racial reckoning coming out of a pandemic. Those can't be ignored. And even if that wasn't the case, and this was shifting to poli community policing, and it's already started to do that MOA is invalid and we don't operate under the model that we told the AG we were going to and that that's fine I mean I'm not you know that's great but you know that 10 point plan was detailed and it was based on having SROs in our building which is no longer the case and we need to define their contact they we need to define the new contact between a school liaison and the school community Mayor, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to keep up and I feel like I'm processing a little yeah. slow tonight. So um, are you suggesting that rather than having an officer with the title school resource officer, we should have a liaison in a parallel model to ways that a single or multiple people in the department are liaisons to other elements of the city? And in, in that case, we wouldn't need an MOA because the relationship between the school and this liaison would simply abide by MGL um, and there would be no need to articulate it more carefully in specificity to what we expect as a school district. And then can I just ask you to clarify what would be the um, danger of, of having an MOA if that MOA is in fact in compliance with MGL? Um, does it not help us as a district kind of articulate procedures for teachers? I, I'm just not quite sure what would be the risk of having a clarified document to articulate that relationship. I think a clarified document is fine, but again, we're talking about an MOA and policies. It would be like using less passing, you know, a policy on buses, right, two years ago, and then deciding things are changing and we're going to keep that policy until we figure it out. I think that there's a way that the policy in this case, it, it's this, the SROs no longer serve in the function as we negotiated with the AG. Um, 
the definition and changes and regulations around uh, police in schools and what community policing looks like are very different than when we wrote that MLA. And there are a lot of policies, I think, in our school that are attached and directed by that 10 point plan and that MOA that, that aren't, you know, aren't relative. We're not doing it. Um, okay, Lori. But Mayor, doesn't this also relate to the fact that now it's no longer required to have an SRO because that policy changed from DESE? When was that, like a year and a half ago? Yeah, I mean, that, that I guess, I mean, that's another fact. I don't have like an answer to that, but, you know, that's another factor. And, and just to go back to Marissa around liaisons, I'm not suggesting narrowing the recommendations of this committee this, and all this amazing work, what I'm asking for is to clarify them. And I do not think that an MOA as, as directed under DESE policy and the AG's model language is appropriate anymore. So my, my thinking is, first of all, that we shouldn't be taking a vote tonight. Um, we need to look into this. Um, I think we need to ask Russ. I think we need to check with the AG's office. Allison can do that um, and get some guidance here before we go forward with any kind of discussion. I just think we're not ready tonight. And uh, we certainly could put it on our June 8th agenda um, to look into. Allison, um, do you think you could get information by then? And Absolutely. Get beforehand. Uh, yeah, I think I can. And the MOA has nothing to do as a school committee. Right. It's it's a, an agreement between the superintendent and the chief of police. Correct. As so, well as the chief procurement officer of the city, which is the mayor, and and results in final liability of anything that happens under that OAM. MOU to it, it results into a city liability. Okay. Can I ask, are we so the current MOA that is on the books, we are not in compliance with it in the sense that the police department does not have the capacity to currently serve that role, or because as a district we have moved and we have made the decision to change our policy? Both. It's okay. And the police department has also agreed to the changes. So it's sort of like I completely understand that we want to have all all policies and agreements up to date and current. Um, and it sounds like, at least from my understanding, of this conversation that that's in process and that will happen. And I certainly hear um, your urgency behind it, Mayor. And I think that that's been heard. And I hear it's definitely from the chair that we're going to move in that direction and have a second conversation. But I think that that I agree that the that's the process to get there is to change the MOA and that's what's going to be happening um, through these next steps. So it does seem like we're moving in the right direction here and taking all these different pieces into consideration. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear the committee, I still ask for the vote, even if it turns out to be a negative vote, I think it needs to be in the record. And I am very curious to see where the police chief is on this because that is not what he's put forward to me. Um, one about the staffing, we had some, um, uh, retirements unexpectedly. I mean, congratulations to them. So we're in the process of trying to hire and very, and we're getting very few applicants as you can imagine. Um, but, but I, I do not think that the, the chief of police is okay with the MOA as it is, nor I think that there's a strong, I, I, I think there's a strong chance that we're not going to need the MOA, especially how we're recategorizing community policing. You know, so to, 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 and I would also ask Allison in your research, would it make sense if um, uh, the committee gets that info as well? Or is that something where they'd be invited to, like, I, I don't know if it would go to policy committee, but, but also the folks who put so much work into this report, um, can they also get this information? The equity, and of course, um, I'm happy. Subcommittee? Uh -huh. The equity yeah. subcommittee? Yeah, 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 wherever you, Shannon, you know, where, I, I'm not sure where the, the best um, committee are placed, but. Yeah, I, I'm happy to share it with whoever. Allison, when does the current MOA expire? 
or did it already? Uh, no, I don't believe it expires. I, I, it, I it has don't to be know reviewed off the annually. top of my head. It has to be signed annually. Um, I, I don't know if we, I, I don't think that we did any changes last year. I think the last time we made changes was 2019. But based um, on the policy, it states that it's reviewed and signed off on annually. And I, I want to say we didn't do it last year. So we're not actually under an MOA right now anyway. Mm -hmm. If you want me to be completely honest. Correct. The last signed one we had, um, Shannon, is 2019. So is this a moot conversation? No. Can I clarify? I just pulled it up. So it does, at the end of it, it says this agreement shall be reviewed annually prior to the start of the school year. This agreement remains in full force and effect until amended or until such time that either of the parties withdraws from this agreement by delivering written notification to the other party. So it, there is not a, um, it, it has to be withdrawn from. It is not something that is just become null and void right. if it hasn't been. So, yeah, but I'm I gonna disagree the on policy, that. policy, yeah. I think the policy yeah. that we have states that it needs to be, you know, agreed upon and yep. signed off on annually. Regardless of change or not. Okay, well, I, I'm reading the actual MOU. As I have MOU now. does not yeah. have that requirement. It's stating that basically it's in effect until it's withdrawn from. I would say that the content of the MOA and the purpose of the parties coming to agreement is no longer pertinent to the use of grant money. So it's not a matter of saying where one party or the other says we want to pull away from the agreement. It's that the body of the agreement, the tent and the purpose is no longer applicable in our school district. And for that second position, not to the grant and how those funds have been expended, which has been a little I don't know, upside down. Um, but that's my point. I mean, we, we don't have a grant fund for this, the school resource officer position. I, I know we do. Oh. oh, we do. And we're not, we're not using it, the SRO model. We're um, using are you community talking policing. about the sec, are you talking about the newer yes, grant? The but, second but one. This committee voted not to accept that position. So that has nothing to do with this memorandum. This committee took a vote last summer. Yeah, I, I think we should table this. I'm going to ask yeah, for a vote to I, agree I think that right. this MOA is no longer in effect. And there needs to be a convening of anybody appropriate to take a look at that, that and talking about the AG and DESE or whatnot. But I think there needs to be a clear message that that is not a thing anymore until we come to another agreement, whatever that looks like. We cannot look at all of our police policies and not consider this one. But Mayor, again, this memorandum isn't from the school committee. So you're, you're asking us to say something that's not our purview is null and void. It is our just, purview. We are not using the SRO, SO, SRO model as defined under statute in the way that you need an MOA, community policing that involves and works with the schools that does not place an SRO in a building does not require an MOA. Things have changed. And my understanding is the police chief agrees with that. Things have changed. So I'm not, I'm not comfortable with taking any vote tonight without us exploring this issue further. I'd like to, you know, have us reach out to the police chief. I'd like us to reach out to um, Russ to get more information, to have Allison talk to um, the AG's office. I mean, I just think there's more work to be done before we make any kind of uh, decision on this point. I, I'm not comfortable with us moving forward without those, those pieces of information. And I would just say that, no, thank you for the consideration I'd like to put on the public record that I believe that the, um, the document under purpose and intent is void and that a signature has to be current 
for the, con it is not an automatic rollover without a current signature and just have that on the public record. Okay. And then we put this on our next agenda to, yep. with, to have more information and to figure this out. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. So we'll put it on the June 8th. Sounds okay. good. All right. If that's it, Dr. LeClaire will go on to yeah. approve uh, payroll and minutes. I just want to say thank you to Dr. LeClaire for accepting our recommendations and bringing them forward. I appreciate it. And and where I was going before we moved forward was to thank everybody for all the compromising <laughs> and the, the thought and the work that was done. Um, I, I, I was really impressed with with what you all came up with. And I, I agree that people didn't always get what they wanted or everything they wanted, but somehow you all came together. So I thought that was wonderful. Um, anybody else before we approve payroll? Okay, I'm turning it over to Marissa. I moved Can you guys all hear the concert next door? <laughs> <I'm sorry>. No. <laughs> it sounds great. Thanks. <laughs> I move to approve school payroll dated 5 20 2021, amount of $582,737.13. Second that. Okay, everybody moved around. So, Marin? Marin Goldstein, aye. Lori? Lori Garcia, aye. Shannon? Shannon Dunham, aye. Jonathan? Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Marissa? Marissa Cray, aye. Mary LaChapelle? Mary LaChapelle, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. I move to approve accounts payable authorization for payment dated 5 20 2021 and the amount of $333,694.81. I'll second that. Erin? Marin Goldstein, aye. Lori Bart Garcia, aye. Shannon? Shannon Dunham, aye. Jonathan, Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Marissa? Marissa Curry, aye. Mirla Chappelle? Mirla Chappelle, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. I move to approve the minutes of the May 11th, 2021 regular session. I'll second that. Aaron, Aaron. Goldstein, aye. Laura Garcia, aye. Shannon. Shannon Dunham, aye. Jonathan, Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Marissa Crary, aye. Mary LaChapelle, aye. And I will abstain since I was not there. Okay, anything other under other? All righty. Then uh, we need a roll call vote to move into executive session. <coughs> Sorry, my allergies are killing me. Um, Marin Goldstein, aye. Larry Garcia, aye. Shannon Dunham, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Marissa Crary, aye. Mary LaChapelle, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. And we will be adjourning from executive session. Good night, everybody. Thank you. <coughs> The recording has stopped. And so just waiting for.